Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, activists, social scientists, government and nonprofit leaders. We speak with each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome playwright and activist Eve Ensler to the program today. Her play, The Vagina Monologues, a celebration of that under-recognized part of the female anatomy, became a worldwide phenomenon and prompted her to found V-Day, a movement to end violence against women and girls. As we learn from the news every day, there is so much work that remains to be done. Her latest book, however, is about her own descent into another kind of violence, that of the cancer patient, and about what that taught her about being in her own body and in the body of the world. In the Body of the World, a memoir has just been published by the Metropolitan Books imprint of Henry Holt and Company. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, in many ways, your book, and it's not totally, but in many ways, it's, it's a kind of cancer journal. What made you decide to write it? Well, I think, I think the book kind of wrote me. You know, um, in some ways, I mean, all the books, are, all the plays I've written, this book came from my body. It was, it was, it was like a, a, a language of, a fever of language, a language of fever that kind of burned through me. And I think it actually began with the diagnosis of the cancer, and then there was the treatment of the cancer, and then there was the book. They were of a whole. Okay. Um, so I think it's, 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 it's much like that. Okay. So you received your diagnosis in March of 2010 and uh, which propelled you, you say, into your own body for the ter seven terrible months. What was your reaction to, to the diagnosis? Well, I, I, I was shocked but not shocked. You know, I, I think one of the things, and I, I talk about it in the book, I think we all know when something's wrong with us someplace in, in our being, but I think I was living in a, in, a, in a rather somnolent state, as I have been for a good portion of my life, kind of half asleep, half awake, where you know things, but you don't know them. And I think when I got the diagnosis, of course, it was shocking, because it's the moment when people rip the veil away and say, here's, here's what you've been denying. Um, I think the scope of the cancer, the stage, you know, it was stage three slash four cancer, the size of a mango inside me, them not knowing initially if it had spread throughout my body, it was, it was, pretty, it was pretty shocking. It was pretty hit you to the ground ground zero, here we are, right. you know. Um, now and you called up, it was Dr. Deb, who yes. was, uh, had been a partner in some of your, she had been a fan of yours at first, and then a partner in some of your, your work um, up with women abroad. And she said, come on out to the Mayo Clinic, uh, which you did. Um, it was interesting, your description of the city of Rochester and the Mayo Clinic. It's a good place, basically, right? It's an amazing place. It's an amazing place. But you arrive in this town, which is basically the Mayo Clinic. I mean, I think it's 30 or 40,000 people work there, and everything in the town supports it. So you sort of like going to Lourdes. It is, <laughs> but it's Cancer Town. Right, like, you right. kind of arrive in the middle of Cancer Town. Okay. And, you know, as I say in the book, if you've been in denial at that point about cancer or about sickness, it's... It's impossible to right. be because you're in the center of it. Do you know? Um, I will say I think the Mayo is one of the most astonishing medical facilities I've ever been to. It's close to socialized medicine as we'll get in this country, and I'm I'm just kind of moved by the whole system of care there and the depth of the care and the fact that m the do the surgeons, for example, have cap salaries, so they're not really? com yes they do so they're not competing with each other for for um, patients and you know everybody's working. As a whole, okay, and you can feel that in the body of the place. Okay, and you met Dr. Hansom. I met Dr. Hansom. Dr. Hansom, and you know the story with Dr. Deb is an amazing story because I had been working with Dr. Deb for months ahead of time. I didn't know her as a patient. She she was organizing a team of doctors and surgeons to come to Bukavu, Congo, to work on this huge project we were doing there. So I knew her as that person, as an activist, and then suddenly I was calling her as a patient. Um, yes, Dr. Hansom was an amazing doctor, amazing surgeon, and um, are you, you're talking about that moment in the, yeah, it was a pretty horrible moment when I was kind of lying on his table, pants pulled to my ankle, him searching to find a tumor in some <laughs> part of your body you don't want someone investigating, right. and he just kind of paused and walked around the table and said very kind words to me which made me realize he actually saw me as a human being and recognized my humanity. And 
I felt in that moment I probably could survive it. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. Now the surgery was huge. Removed your, removed your uterus, ovary, cervix, fallopian tubes, lymph nodes, lymph channels, the top part of your vagina, the tissue and the pelvic cavity that surrounded the cervix. They rebuilt your rectum from a portion of your colon. They pretty much gouged you out. They did. Right? Um, and you, you write that it felt like they were removing a kind of flesh monument to the horrific stories that women around the world had told you, that perhaps all those stories had gathered, congregated inside you. Well, it felt like that. You know, on my way to, to flying to the Mayo, I, I, I had been told that there was something the size of a mango inside me, and I just closed my eyes, and I had this image of a, 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 a ball of yarn, and it was just all these stories, and just had letters, women's rape, battery, incest, all mm -hmm. the years. But I think also one of the things I, I've kind of learned from this experience or think is that I think we don't look at the relationship between trauma and cancer and trauma and illness. And I think it, there's, there's a direct correlation and, and a, an undeniable correlation. And I think through this experience, I've seen how, you know, the fact that cancer cells live in our body dormant and they're there in all of us. You know, and that something triggers them coming to be, activates them, and usually it's when the immune system breaks down. So what are the things that break our immune system down? Stress, trauma, these are the things that cause that. And I think from, as a child, obviously, I've been through severe trauma, you know, through the violence of my father and the sexual abuse of my father. And then my life was fairly traumatic, in, as many of our lives are, in trying to get back into our bodies or right. find a way back into this contaminated landscape. And then... I spent the rest of my life for the last 20 years traveling the world listening to women who were in very similar situations, kind of absorbing their trauma. And then I landed up in the Congo, which really is the most brutalized place on the planet. In terms of the way, well, certainly the way women and girls are treated, and perhaps other people. Everybody. Well, why, I mean, why is it so bad in the Congo? How did it get to be that way? Why? Well, I think the Congo is a perfect example of where a, hi a history of un un unimaginable colonialism, you know, um, you know, under King Leopold and what happened then, the Belgian, you know, the desecration of the population of, of Congo. Twenty million people died. We're talking about hands being cut off for rubber. Um, so many women were raped. Um, it was completely colonized and completely enslaved and completely destroyed. And then years afterwards of having all these different leaders from Mobutu on who were very corrupt leaders who stole and pillaged and continued. And then when they had wanted their own leader to come forward, that person was assassinated um, by the U.S. who was kind of behind that. So we have a history in the Congo of enormous colonialism. Then you have a country that is deeply rich in resources with coltane and copper and gold, and coltane which goes into our cell phones and our playstations and our computers, which the world is pillaging and has been pillaging forever, not leaving it to the indigenous Congolese. And, and so you have that. And the way now that militias are getting access to those mines is, and those militias are proxies for the West and for the international companies that are stealing those or pillaging those minerals, they send in the militias into the villages they use rape as a systematic tactic where they rape babies, they rape eight-year-old girls. And most of these militias are not Congolese militias, they're outside militias from Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi. And then they desecrate the family structure by forcing husbands to rape daughters, sons to rape mothers, etc. The, the family is, is, is fractured, they flee, and the militias move in and they have access to the right. minerals. Right. So we're seeing now this kind of um, coming together of colonialism, racism, sexism, and capitalism, and it's all being It's just a horror. It's just a, a horror, horror enacted on the bodies of right, women. Right, right. You know? They even, back at, at the Mayo Clinic, they even discovered that you had a fistula, which is what, um, uh, an obsession fistula is what a lot of women in the developing countries have. So that was another connection that you had. It was a them. very deep connection. And, I, and many of the women who are raped um, end up having with having fistulas. I, I've actually sat in some of the operations to see what a fistula looked like because I met so many women who had them. But when women are gang raped or when objects are shoved into women or things are put inside them, they create a hole inside the body which basically prevents you from holding your pee and poop. And, and so you're leaking all, all the time. time. You're leaking urine, and so you're, you're leaking feces and smelling. And you're, and you're completely exiled right, from your right, community. Right. So it was very strange that my tumor had ended up fistulating you know, I had a fistula into um, my rectum, and and the doctor actually said he hadn't seen it anything like it. That he felt it was some kind of strange connection. Yeah. 
So you return, okay, um, you've had your surgery, but the, the nurses at Mayo were just seemed like angels, right? Angels. Can angels. we just talk about nurses? Can we just have a moment of praise? <laughs> a of moment nurses? of silence and no, praise for No, nurses. really, I feel like every day I get up and I think about nurses because you can abso absolutely need the best. You need great doctors, you need great surgeons. It's undeniable. But the people who really help you through are the nurses. Are the right. nurses. Right. When you wake up and you have tubes coming out of every body, part of your body, and you have suddenly been cut open and you don't know who you are anymore and you have parts removed, it's the nurses who are by your side every minute taking care of you, nurturing you, running to every time you're in pain. And I just, I just started to focus on nurses in the hospital. Yeah. I started to think about the people who care for us right. in this world and right. how undervalued, underpaid, underseen they are and how they really hold, whether they're nurses or teachers or, or um, domestic workers, those are the people who are keeping us here. Right, right. You know? So you return to New York uh, and you've developed an abdominal abscess from the leaking of bad stuff into your stomach. Mm -hmm. And the abscess requires antibiotics, uh, which are given intravenously, and drainage as well. This was done at Sloan Kettering, which sounded like a nightmare. I mean, I was reminded of the Pulitzer Prize winning play, Wit, mm -hmm. you know, about the cruelty yes. and indifference of doctors who sort of seem like the cancer patients are all sort of like part of a one big experiment, guinea pigs, mm -hmm. not really human beings. Um, it was very much like that, and and I, I and you know it, it's that thing of beware of getting the best, you know. I, I because was, nobody ever gets the best of small <laughs> gathering. They supposedly have it, but you, you, the patients never get it. No, right. and, and, and I've heard and, that. And, and yes, I think they are a great research hospital, and they know a lot. But the way they treat patients, no. And and I got I got much much sicker there because of the poor, of just the poor care, just mm -hmm. the lack of attention, mm -hmm. and, and actually kind of. I felt abused uh, right. quite a few times in the process there, just by people not paying attention to me being in pain and pushing past that and ignoring me screaming. And um, so I was in very bad shape um, during that period um, at Sloan Kettering. Right. And I saw the difference between what good care does and bad care does. You know, how having been loved and nurtured and supported at the Mayo and, and nurses had time and they weren't you know, and, and everyone wasn't so overburdened with work and pressure that they could focus on you versus right. what happened at Sloan Kettering. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll be back with more with Eve Insler, author of In the Body of the World, a memoir in just a moment. Ma, guess what? I went back to college. No, I didn't quit my job. I'm finishing my degree with a CUNY online bachelor's in business. I interact online with real City University of New York faculty on a schedule that fits my busy life. Ma, you should look who's teaching at CUNY. And it all leads to a high quality Bachelor of Science degree in business. I can attend class anywhere, anytime. Yes, Mom, even at your house Friday night for dinner. The CUNY Online Baccalaureate. Get back to business. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm speaking with the playwright and activist Eve Insler, her latest book, In the Body of the World, a memoir. So you managed to survive Sloan Kettering, but your, do uh, your trusted um, do long-term doctor advises you to undergo chemotherapy. I mean, you're basically cancer-free, but this is a preventive kind of, of, of thing. Um, what was the chemo like? Well, I have to say, of all the things in the process, I was most terrified of chemotherapy. I, there is something about people putting poison into your body or in one, that is just absolutely devastating. And I really thought I was going to be one of those people who could not do it, like I would just die. And I had an amazing thing happen where a woman who had been my therapist for years, who I hadn't Dr. been... Dr. Sue. Dr. Sue, appeared one day, and she said, I heard you have cancer, and I'm going to give V-Day a gift, and I'm going to sit on your couch once a week with you, and I'm going to help you get through chemo. And she came right before I was going to begin, and I was absolutely terrified. And she did what I call in the book a sue. She just took it and she gave it to me in a whole other way where it suddenly changed the whole reality of what chemo was. And she said, look, Eve, the chemo is not for you. It's for your cancer. It's for all the perpetrators in your past. It's for all the women's bodies, you've, all the stories you've heard. And she said, this time you're going to get rid of all the badness that's been projected onto you. And every time it goes into you, that poison is just going to kill off everybody who needs to go. And suddenly I couldn't wait to go to chemo. I mean, she just had turned. <laughs> really? He was just like, all right, let's get let's him out. Go. <laughs> 
I mean, it really, get it. It really was like that. Uh -huh. I would go and I would, five hours of this grew, just gruesome stuff going into my body. But she said, and when you get nauseous, imagine they're working overtime mm -hmm. to kill these perpetrators mm -hmm. and kill this bad. It's a kind of visualization kind of. It was. Yeah. And I'll yeah. tell you, everything is our frame, right? Uh -huh. How do you see things right. determines the experience. So by the end of chemo, which went on for quite a long time. How long? About how well, long? I had five treatments, uh -huh. you know, so we, it was weeks and weeks and weeks. Okay. Like months. Okay. Months. Okay. And by the end, I got to tell you, I feel like these, the demons are gone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you also had your tree that helped you. Your the tree, tree. tree outside your room. Yes. And I have to say, again, when you're not connected to your body, it's very hard to connect to nature or the, or the earth because there's that disconnect, I think, goes all the way around. I had been such an urban person and had sworn off trees earlier in my life. And I got put in a room during my illness with, I couldn't move because I was so sick during the infection. There was just a tree in front of me. And at first I thought, I will go out of my mind. And then two days later, I fell in love with the tree. And all I wanted to do was be with the tree, meditate on bark, think about trunk, think about leaves, think about, and, and just the way the tree changed in the light and whether it rained. And it was the beginning of my return to the world, mm -hmm. my return to nature, my return to the, to the mother, you know. What did your cancer experience teach you about death? Or did it change your view of death? Oh, d deeply. I, I, think, I think when someone hands you a diagnosis of stage three cancer, you kind of die. Like there's a part of you that goes, you're dead, <laughs> it's over. And you hit a kind of a flat bottom. And I love the Zen admonition here, which says live, live as if you already are dead or live as, or, as if you've died. I feel kind of like I'm already dead. Like I feel now, this is all extra. I'm in the extra. I'm in second wind. I'm in, wow, that shouldn't have happened, but it did for whatever. And I feel incredibly lucky that I had health care, that I had surgeons and doctors who removed this from my body. I mean, I, I think about Congo. Probably that you lived in the United States. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I mean, in Congo, they don't even use the word cancer. They don't have a CAT scan in most. I, I think they might have one CAT scan. So by the time you get your diagnosis, you're You don't you're, even get diagnosed. On your way. Okay. You, you just don't, die. You just die. Okay. No one even uses the word cancer. Yeah. You know? What did your experience teach you about love? I think, I think basically, just to finish the question about death, okay. because I think what I feel about death now is because of whatever happened about getting me back into this body, death doesn't feel anywhere near as frightening anymore. I think it's, it's how we live that determines how we die. And, it, and in terms of love, I think the big lesson was, I think most of us are sold this bill of goods about love when we're young, that you're going to meet that person, that guy, that woman, whatever. The big love. The big love. The all-encompassing, take you off your feet, spin you to the moon kind of love. And, you know, I've been in long-term relationships where I hadn't found that I, it, momentarily maybe at the beginning or at moments. But I had failed at that kind of love. And one day in the middle of my chemo, um, I, I have to say, like, the care I had from friends and from... Toast, who's a character in this book and who's a dear, intimate, supportive colleague, and, and my sister, and just, there was just so much love. At one point I said, if I die, it's going to be embarrassing. You just had people who converged? Yeah, people uh, just From all over, the up. population of, of, of Rochester. <laughs> people just came. Double. People just loved. And, and I just thought, one day I looked around and I went, what am I think I'm waiting for? This is the life of love that mm -hmm. I dreamed of. It's here. It's present. We create our own narratives. We have to give up other people's stories that are always making us feel like failures. Right. Throughout all of this, it is amazing. You kept in touch with Mama C and the other women, people at, this, at the City of Love, which is this oasis that uh, has been created for women in the Congo, abused women in the Congo. Um, why? Did that help keep you going? Well, City of Joy w was this place in the Congo that was... Did I say City of Love? I yeah, meant but City it's, of it's Joy. the same. City of Joy, City of Love, it's all the same. <laughs> I kind of like City of Love. Um, but it was a place that was being built literally by the women of Congo, for the women of Congo, owned by the women of Congo, run by the women of Congo. And my, wor my work, my promise was that I would find the means and find the money and help them build it, you know? And I, I, had, to, I had to keep that promise. Like, right. I just knew that. Like, I just couldn't die. And it's specifically it for women who have gone through traumatic... It's for women who have experienced the worst suffering in the war, the, the multiple rapes, the incredible abuse. Women arrive with missing limbs, bullet holes in their head, you know, fistula, um, nightmares. You know, I, I, I've seen the worst 
stories come into the city of joy mm -hmm. and 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 it was their dream to have this place right. we asked them what they wanted and this is what they wanted so i i had to live for that so every single day i talked to mama c on the phone it was like i don't care what state i'm in i'm not letting her down now within weeks after it was all over your cancer ordeal they'd taken out they'd uh uh taken out the port um they'd taken that they reattached your intestines um, and three weeks later, you're over at the City of Joy, over in the Congo. And you write about your return there and about finding joy there. And I'd like you to read that portion okay. for us. Okay. There will be joy here. Joy, happiness, delight, pleasure, bliss, ecstasy, elation, thrill, elation, thrill, exultation, rapture. This joy will be palpable when you walk through the gates. It will be found in the green grass, in the voices of the women, in the taste of their home-cooked kasava, sweet potatoes, fufu, and peas, in their grateful bodies dancing and dancing to what will feel like a ceaseless drum. It will move through you and you will touch joy and suddenly realize you have never felt joy because it requires abandon. It grows from gratitude and cannot exist where there is mad cynicism or distrust. You will touch this joy and you will suddenly know it is what you were looking for your whole life, but you were afraid even to acknowledge the absence because the hunger for it was so encompassing. I am standing at the entranceway of the new city. I am still thin and weak. My body is not yet fully mine in the last stages of the cancer conversion. I'm not sure who I will be when all this is over or where I will live or even what I will want to do with my life. But I know for sure that there will be joy. You're, the book is really about how, and you, you started off talking about how you've always been disconnected from your body and disconnected from the world because of you know, the family thing, sickness that you went through. How did your cancer reconnect you to your body and reconnect you to the world? I think my disconnection from my body was about, um, I had left here because it was so painful. And I went out there, <laughs> circling myself with something to prove, with a mission to show the world I had value, that I had a right to exist, that I wasn't the bad, rotten, terrible, awful, selfish person that I felt I was. And I think what happened when I, I came back into my body is everything changed because I was now in myself. And it wasn't about me anymore, oddly. It wasn't about me proving anything. It was about me connecting with what was around me. And, and I think when I went back to the Congo, I saw it in a way I'd never felt it. It was like there was no divide. It was just, you know, it, it, it's like during the Gulf spill, I had those toxins in me and I was the Gulf. And tree, I was tree. And when I was with the women of Congo, it was our struggle. This is our story. This is our world. And I think that separation has led us all to believe that somehow we're not in this together. We're not in the same story. And it's funny. I think so much in America is about me, 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 the self, 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 my needs, my. But people are miserable, right? Because to live in this and not live in this, do you know, to be about this narcissistic me, but not to be in the, 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 the me that connects you to the whole is, is what suffering is. And I think now, my life, okay, important, but it already happened in a way. I kind of died already. Now I get to be in this. Now you get your second win. And I get to be in the big story. I get mm -hmm. to be connected up with everybody. And that means I'm fighting for, like, this week in Bangladesh, the building that collapsed and kills hundreds of workers because people are sent into that building to make money for corporations. I'm there. I was in Bangladesh this year. I felt completely, so now we're, we're, we're raising a fund and we're, we're trying to connect what we can to support those women. I feel connected. I feel like we're in everything. And everything is in us, whether it's the Congolese war, which appears to be way over there. It's about our cell phones. It's about our PlayStations. It's a coal chain that goes into our stations that's perpetuating that war. So how do we stop perpetuating that war? It's our practices on a daily basis that are creating climate change. How do we shift our practices? It's the understanding of the intersection and the interconnected of everything. And I'm very happy to be in that place. Well, I, it's an amazing book, and I think it has a lesson for all of us about how to be in our own bodies and in the body of the world. And I thank you for writing it. Thank you. And uh, good luck.
Thank you very on much. Your, on your book tour. And with the, and with the city of... Joy. Joy. <laughs> the city of love. I'd like the to city think we're going to call it city of love. I like it. <laughs> I want to thank Eve Ensler for joining us. In the Body of the World, a memoir has just been published by the Metropolitan Books imprint of Henry Holt and Company. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.